Okay, good morning everyone, thanks for coming. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about the great cocky count. Um, I'll kick it off by just talking a bit about Carnaby's black cockatoo. Because Carnaby's is where the great cocky count started. That was the, uh, the focus of the count for the first few years. And, um, and so that was the real push to get it started. So the species is quite charismatic. Um, it's, uh, it's a beautiful bird and it's a bit of a larrikin and people really engage and love Carnaby's black cockatoos. It's active during the day which which helps us. It's easier to um, to survey a bird which is um, active in the day. It's easily detectable so it's quite a large bird. It flocks together so that can be in the hundreds or even in the thousands at some times. And it's also noisy so not only can you can you hear the bird, but you can, uh, can you see it, but you can also hear it. So that helps people um, to to find the birds, and it's urban frequenting. So Perth is a stronghold for carnabies, and this has helped the great cocky count um, because we have a lot of people to uh, to survey for us. Okay, we've harnessed the species biology of this bird. Um, for, uh, for the project. Uh, so this bird, there's quite a lot known about it. It's been studied for, uh, for quite a long time. So we know about its movement patterns. So we know during the day, they wake up in a, a roost, which is a, a, cl uh, a clump of large uh, eucalypts normally. They'll go to, uh, to water to drink. And then through the day, they'll move through the landscape, um, finding food and finding areas to rest and they'll go back to water and they'll uh, go to, uh, to roost normally. So uh, we also know their seasonal patterns. So uh, this is a bird that in the, um, in the summer and the autumn spends its time in coastal areas. So that's Perth and the uh, southwest of WA. Uh, in winter and spring, they'll move out into the wheat belt into the southwest forest to breed. So um, that's, that's, uh, that knowledge has helped us with the great cocky count. They roost com communally, so often in large groups, um, they'll, they'll come together um, in the evening in large groups. As I say, that can be in the hundreds and also the thousands. They're faithful to roost sites. So that doesn't mean that they're always at the same roost every night, but es especially with large roosts, those roosts will be occupied most of the time. Smaller roosts, they may have a few that they, um, they interchange on different nights, but they're fairly predictable in, in that pattern. So all of these factors came together in the design of a simultaneous evening roost count, which is the great cocky count. And that was developed by, um, by Ron Johnston at the WA Museum, along with um, Parks and Wildlife and BirdLife WA. <coughs> okay, so it's an annual event. It's happened every year since 2010. It's citizen science driven, so all of our counters are volunteers. But it sits within a scientific framework. So the data that we collect goes uh, into, it go, gets analysed. It, uh, we have trend analysis um, that, uh, that shows how the population is trending from year to year. And it's a vital tool for the recovery plan. So this is the best data that we have for, um, for black cockatoos on where the populations, where the birds are roosting and how the population is trending. And you know, state agencies, um, federal agencies, they depend on this data for their, for their planning purposes. And it's also evolved over time. So as I said, we started out just um, counting carnabies. We now count um, bodans and forest red tails as well. And we've gone from just counting in the Perth Peel region to counting the whole of the southwest. <coughs> so a very large area. Okay, so how do you run a great cocky count? Well, uh, there's, there's a few steps. We start probably in mid-January with a volunteer call-out. So um, we do a call-out to our members and supporters via email uh, through different partners. So people like Peel Harvey Catchment Council 
NRM groups, Parks and Wildlife, to get the word out there. There's a little bit of print media, but these days it's pretty much um, focused on uh, social media, so through Facebook and other tools like that, getting the word out there. <coughs> we have training workshops, so every year between 10 and 12 workshops um, happen, and we get three or 400 people who learn about black cockatoos, how to ID them, how to do the great cocky count. Uh, there's a volunteer registration, so that's an online form, a Google form, so it's pretty easy for people to do. That opens in mid-January and it runs through to, uh, to mid-March. And then comes the, the, my job, which is allocating um, sites. So it's a, it's a pretty tricky process. This is my life for about a month in the year. I, uh, I have to pair every single dot, which are the volunteers, to uh, a tree, which are the roosts. Uh, we have between seven, nine hundred volunteers and 800 sites so you know that's a it's a big task and I feel a bit like God sending people here there and everywhere um, so that's good fun um, when we allocate the sites uh, we then send out an email saying uh, this is your site please go here at sunset on uh, on the day and um, and that's how that works and then we have the great cocky count so uh, early to mid-April, the Great Cocky ha happens on a single um, evening. <coughs> then people, so pe the, the basic process is people go to the roost, they count the birds as they land in the roost, and they, uh, they write it down and they, they send us an email saying, um, you know, these, this is what we counted. So those data are then um, collected and compiled um, and analysed. And then we have the Great Cocky Count Report, which comes out every year around September, October. <coughs> okay, I talked a bit about coverage earlier. Now this is a comparison of 2010, the first year, um, and you can see that all of the sites are very much focused on Perth, and um, it's the Perth Peel region where um, all of those sites are. This. Um, this map shows the 2018 sites. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but the sites range all the way from north of Geraldton over to Esperance. There's a fair clump in the Albany Sterling Range area. Um, the capes are well um, represented, and there's a cluster of sites all the way through um, this band, which, um, which surveys pretty well um, where, where the birds are. Um, at that time of year. <coughs> okay, what makes the Great Cocky Count great? So one, it's easy for the public to do. It's not a big ask because we're asking for, you know, three hours of their time, basically on one day in the year, and this means that we get quite a lot of volunteers. Uh, the population trends make the results important, so this is, this is really important data um, that's collected and people um, understand that they're making a big contribution to, um, to the conservation of these species. It also raises awareness of, of habitat. So a lot of people aren't really aware of, of the natural habitat. Maybe we're too busy, we're too glued to our screens and other stuff that's going on. When, they do, when people do the Great Cocky Count, they might find that there's a roost site just in the in uh, their local park, uh, in their local reserve, or even in their back garden. And that raises awareness of, oh, you know, this is important habitat. What, what do we need to do to protect it? Uh, you know, should we be out there planting more trees? And should we lobby um, our local council to retain more trees? Which is um, a really important aspect of the Cocky Camp. Now, we get a lot of zeros, unfortunately, in the, uh, in the cocky count. People going to their roost sites and they stand there for an hour or two and they go home again <laughs> um, because no birds turn up. But um, it's really important data. Obviously, the, um, the significance of a, a zero is um, the same as, uh, as a larger number to uh, a statistician. But we need to get this message out to our volunteers 
that, um, that, that is important. So we do educate people uh, on the importance of, uh, of the zeros and um, we try to, you know, if a volunteer has had a couple of zeros, I'll try and give them a, uh, what I think is a better site next year to, to, um, to keep them in, you know, interested and to retain those volunteers. And we put that word out on social media as well that, you know, um, how important those are. What I discovered probably only after a year or so was that there are actually what I call good and uh, bad nil results. So um, a good is when we send someone to uh, a Dinkum night roost and they don't count any birds. A bad one is when we send them to a, a site that probably hasn't been checked out enough and it turns out to not be a night roost. It could be a feeding area that someone has reported and, um, and it's not actually a night roost. So um, the, these, this table just shows you uh, the nil results as a proportion of all sites surveyed. And you can see uh, in 2010 all the way through to 2015 they were quite high in the 60s and 70s. Over the last few years I've been trying to, um, to zero in on, on your, what are the best sites, uh, what are the sites that we probably shouldn't send people to so we're not wasting their time and so that we're getting the best data that we can. And I'm pretty proud that we got under 50% this year. Uh, that figure probably won't go below, much below 35, 40%, just because of the inherent nature of the count. But you know, that's something that we, um, we do need to think about. Now, the numbers of volunteers have grown massively over the years. So we had about 250 in the first year, that went right up to 900 last year and back down 750 this year. You might see that as uh, not being good. I actually saw it as, as quite a good thing because <laughs> last year was uh, really hard <laughs> allocating all those volunteers. Uh, and a lot of those volunteers, those extra volunteers were actually in the city where we had enough people and it just makes the, the job harder to, to allocate the sites. It doesn't necessarily get more sites surveyed. So um, I, I think uh, that 750 is probably a good number. And what we also think, need to think about is where the volunteers are. So we need more volunteers in regional areas, and that's a big push for us, is to get people out into regional areas so we can cover those areas better. We've had about 3,000 um, participants um, since 2010, and there's, there's, so there's about an, a 50% annual retention rate. And it's about building a relationship with people so that they, um, they do um, return year after year through newsletters, social media, um, and emails. Um, and some of the things we do is provide information, so things like booklets. Um, we have other events and surveys during the, during the year. We can give advice on things like nest boxes uh, and food plants. And we also have um, land management agreements where um, you know, uh, landowners can, uh, can get engaged. Okay, what can other people uh, learn from the GCC? Well, this first one might sound a bit funny, pick uh, a charismatic species. Um, now, you can't always pick your species, obviously. You, sometimes you just need to work on a particular one. But you may be managing a parcel of land and um, it has many different species. You could potentially zoom in on, you know, what's the most charismatic one to engage more volunteers. Uh, it's a very powerful thing when you do have an iconic or charismatic species. Um, harness the biology and ecology of the species, as, as I um, mentioned earlier. Design simple methods, which can be replicated and repeated over time. So simple is good with citizen science because, you know, your volunteers aren't always going to be scientists and um, you need to um, have a method that they can all follow. Start small and grow over time. So the number of volunteers you have should probably dictate how
how much work you're going to do. As you grow your volunteer numbers, you can, you can build up the number of sites you survey. Get people involved and keep them engaged. Um, so that's, that's an impo important part of it. And try and understand what motivates your volunteers. So with the great cocky count, I think it's uh, you know a love of the birds and wanting to find out um, about the data, which is an important part, and we try and always give that to people. Refine your methods over time. Um, make it easy to register and publish the results so people want to know you know what you're doing with the um, with the data. Um, just a few thanks. Uh, thanks to all my volunteers. And I, I know there are a few in the room today. Thanks to the landowners that, um, that uh, have uh, sites on their land. To State NRM for providing the funding for this year's Great Cocky Count. To Keith Lightbody for quite a few of the photos in that slide show. And to Beck for organising the symposium. Well, uh, it doesn't. It doesn't form part of the report. Uh, it was a trial, trial cocky count really, um, and um, there there weren't many sites surveyed, and I think the methods changed slightly from to the to the first one in 2010. So we can't actually compare the data. So I guess yeah, sometimes it does count as a cocky count, but not quite kind of thing. So. <laughs> Well, I mean, one of the big things uh, was a lot of the roosts were amalgamated in 2006. In 2010, people divided a uh, 2006 roost was divided into eight or ten smaller roosts. So it didn't make it hard to compare back. Yep. Adam, how much do you rely on data collected outside the camp to determine whether a roost site is? Uh, it's definitely important. So we all, I always ask people when when people because uh, most sites are uh, identified by members of the public, and um, these days when someone says oh, I found a roost site, I'll, I'll really try and interrogate them. You know, um, okay, have you seen them during the day or at night, <coughs> and uh, how many birds and what species, and so really trying to. Um, just corroborate that that is uh, uh, an actual roost site. And the main period for that is probably January through to April because you know there's a seasonal effect as well. So if someone reports a, uh, a site in September, it may not necessarily be a roost site in April. So there is, um, yeah, it's an important component of it. Yeah, so you've got a mechanism for sucking in that data yeah, we don't necessarily use uh, the the data or the counts, yeah. but that forms the basis of you know okay we're gonna we're gonna get there for the great <coughs> hockey count or yeah. not. Because it's a remarkable step that your that your yield percentage is dropping while the, the number of participants is increasing massively. Is that have you allocated multiple observers to a single roof site? Yeah, definitely. I mean, some some sites have fifty. People, right. some will have one, so there's a, a range of different. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Okay, well, we'll move on. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank you.